we're calling this series Staying Alive because we're after that phrase, are you alive to God? Are, are, are you alive to God? At any moment, we are all sort of somewhere on a continuum, aren't we, of either alive to God, close, connected, filled with the Spirit of God, walking in the ways of God, attuned to who He is in, in His presence in our life, or we're not. And we're somewhere on that. Here's the good news, that no matter where you may be with God at this moment, you can be resuscitated and revived and renewed and rejuvenated. Jesus is as close as a breath away. We sometimes think it's a long road back. It's not. He's as close as a breath, and we can become alive, if you will, to God. And we want to talk about that. The, the James 4.8 says, draw near to God, and He will draw near to you. So this is the idea, and we're inviting everyone to have a connection with Christ that's, that's deep in that way. Now, when we're close to God, we talked about how there are symptoms of soul health. Our soul is our whole life. And when you are close to God, you have certain symptoms that come out in your life, and we've talked about these, right? Things that pop up and show in your life when you are alive to God. And you know what they are for you. We, we, we'll throw up that word cloud here. Some of us get more irritable. Some of us become more angry or fearful or afraid when you're not connected to God. And you're, not, you're, like, a, you're like a branch that's, that's disconnected from the vine. You're grumpy or tired or impatient or selfish or lonely more often. You have your own symptoms, don't you? And then in the same way, when we are alive to Christ and aware of his presence, that he's with us and for us and, and walking with him in obedience to him and seeking his will and, and his, in our life, wow, different stuff leaks out of us. Am I right? Like we're just in a whole different place. We have gratitude. We have happiness. We have more joy, less fearfulness. We're more secure. We're thoughtful. We're kind. All these things come out of us. We have more patience, more creativity, all of that. So the question is, we all want to live out of the second list. We live so much of our lives in the first list, and we don't need to. We live way too much out of that first list. We don't need to. We can live out of the second list, but probably not on your own just by trying to fake it to make it, when we're actually alive to God and his life is through us, that's called the Holy Spirit, then we have a shot at living a life that's out of the second list. So the question is, how do we get there? How? So last week, we talked about how um, I'm, I'm going I'm to be sharing each week a sort of tool or strategy that's been really helpful to me and lots of other people. And uh, last week, we kind of kicked that off and I, and I shared um, something called Pathways. Because we remind ourselves, God doesn't make cookie-cutter people. We're all distinctly different and unique in the way that we're configured and wired and, and our propensities and our desires. And, and that's why there are at least nine different pathways that we talked about that will be unique. One of them, or maybe more than one, will be unique to you about how you best connect with God. And so for you, it may be that you especially need to get outdoors more often because your heart leaps toward God in an outdoor setting. Or maybe it's through serving other people. Or maybe it's through study. Maybe it's through engaging with justice issues. Or maybe it's just by letting your heart of compassion connect. Or art and music and beauty. There's lots of different ways. All of them are valid. All of them are found in the Bible. And you know what? We're all going to do some of them. We're going to engage with Scripture. We're going to be together in corporate worship. But you have a pathway that will help you stay alive to God. And so I, I encourage you to find that. If you don't know about that, um, you know, there was a handout, but there's a bunch of stuff on the web. Here's a, let me show you a website. It's a Staying Alive resource page. It's kind of a hub where we've got all kinds of great resources for you guys. Leftovers and bonus material and all the stuff we talk about every week is on that website. It's mountaincc.org forward slash staying alive. I really encourage you to go there. And uh, today, if you'll take out, you should have a sheet of paper if you're at one of our campuses. You're going to want to take some notes on what we're going to talk about the tool today. At home, find something to write on or find some notes. Um, you can also go to the hub at where I just pointed you and you'll find some good stuff there. I want to help you know and introduce you to something that I suspect is brand new to a lot of us. It was kind of new to me, even though I'd heard about it, I just never practiced it until fairly recently in my life. Kind of something that, like an old book I pulled off the shelf that all of a sudden has proved to be really helpful to me. Uh, it's something called the examine. The examine. It's, um, it's centuries old, but... I hope you'll feel like it's fresh 
and new for you. Examine is kind of a strange word the way it's spelled, you notice, but you can kind of easily identify. In that word examine, the way it's spelled there, you see our words examine and examination, and it basically means the same thing. Examine is from a Latin word that um, refers to one of those little weight indicators on a balance scale. So the idea of examine is to try to get a real accurate and true assessment of the situation. That's, that's what the word means, okay? So examine goes way, way, way back. It goes back, starts with a guy named Ignatius of Loyola. Some of you have heard of that name. There's schools and churches and stuff like that named after Ignatius of Loyola. You've heard of that. He was a Spanish theologian and preacher, found, uh, founder of something called the Society of Jesus. Around 1524, he wrote something called the Spiritual Exercises, which was like a series of meditations and prayers that were meant to be used on a retreat over like a 30-day period that would help a person discern the will of God for your life and to try to help you come to just a deeper, fuller-on commitment to follow Jesus no matter what. And that's what his passion was. Uh, the picture that you see there, the painting of Loyola, You'll notice he has a leg wound. He suffered that in battle. A cannonball broke his leg and banged up the other one. I'm here on crutches out of solidarity and, and as a nod to uh, Loyola. But it wasn't just his legs that were shattered. He was a broken man. He's 26 years old. He's an orphan his whole life. His parents are dead. His brother dies in the war. His other brother goes to America and never comes back. And he's desperate and alone and laid up in bed. And for the first time in his life, after going and blowing, running and gunning for so long, he stops and thinks about things. He thinks about his life, where it's going and who he is. He starts to become aware of things he's grateful for that he never noticed before. And he starts to read some scripture and some things that other people who were on fire for God had written, and he becomes on fire. And he has this huge passion, and that's where, on that bed, he writes the spiritual exercises. The foundational piece of that is this thing called the examine. One of the keys to the examine is this biblical principle that God speaks to us, of course, in so many ways, most notably through Jesus, also so powerfully and authoritatively through the Bible, but that God also speaks to us through our deepest feelings and yearnings. We're created in God's image, and there are so many things baked into who we are that if we'll pay attention, we can learn a lot about what God's trying to say to us. Not all of our desires are whole and holy and pure because we're sinners. But as we learn to discern what's from God and what's not, we learn the God behind those yearnings. Sometimes, if you're like me, we don't hear from God how we might because we're so busy or running and going, doing, talking, creating, making. And when we sit down and be still, we can kind of hear some of those deep longings that are there churning around all the time and they come out in weird ways but they're there and see that God is speaking through them. Ignatius talked about two kinds of primary feelings that we have in life. One he called consolation and these are the times when life is really good and you're feeling full and whole and happy and glad. You know those times? Where just life is good. It's kind of a shalomi thing. It's like satisfying and you're really connected with God, with other people and yourself. And then there are, there are times that are quite the opposite, right? There are times that he called times of desolation. And those times of desolation are the, exactly the opposite. There are times you just feel kind of empty or off, not fulfilled, kind of drained. You're disconnected from yourself and you're frazzled and you're disconnected from God and other people and everything's just kind of out of sync. That's a time of desolation where you feel desolate. And the examine is a process of learning where you are and what God is saying to you. Now let me ask you a question. Which of those experiences, consolation or desolation, is God involved in in your life? Both, right? But we have to learn to look for it and see what he's saying and doing. 
So examine is the process of examining ourselves and having God examine us, to listen to our hearts, to tap into those places where we are alive and full and grateful, full of God's love, because that's a clue about how to be alive to God. And also to pay attention to the hard times, to the lonely, empty, sad stuff that we sometimes like to ignore, the times you feel ashamed or stupid or afraid or angry, because those are moments when we feel far from God, we've got to pay attention. Most of our life is spent in either consolation or desolation, isn't it? Almost every day, in fact, usually back and forth several times. So paying attention to what we're doing. You know, if we live an unexamined life, well, then we're not going to grow. Let me explain what I mean. Let me say it again. If we live an unexamined life, we, we're not going to grow. Let that just be a challenge to you. You've maybe heard it said, experience is the best teacher. You heard that, expre that expression? Experience is the best teacher. And I think it kind of means, you know, you can't sit in a classroom or something. You've got to get out and do it. I get that to a point. But, you know, it's not really true. Experience is not the best teacher. Doing something over and over again, if you're doing it in a bad or wrong way, isn't really a very good teacher at all. You know, to, to use a sports analogy, um, when I first took up tennis as about eight-year-old, went down to the backboard and hit it. You know what? I held the racket incorrectly. I held the grip wrong. I swung wrong. As a result, it was inefficient. It was weak. I couldn't. My aim was bad. I didn't have any power or control. Hal was my first tennis coach. It was free. My mom found it in the paper. He was trying to get new, new, uh, new, new kids. So I got to go hang out with Hal, and he gave me a gift. And the gift was observation. That's what a coach does. He observes. It doesn't have to be a best player on the field. The coach has to have the gift of observation. He has to be able to see things. He has to be able to examine things. He examined my swing, and he said, you know what? You're holding that wrong. I said, I am? Yeah, how about try this. And bring your racket back like this and step this way. You're off balance. And you know what? He corrected a few things, and my swing improved. I'm still working on it. I wish I could find Hal. I got a few things I need to work out still. But the key is not just to have experience, but what? Evaluated experience. Now you've got something that will help you grow. When you have evaluated experience, the examine gives me a way to do that with my life and to invite God into that process, to say, have a look-see, coach. Help me see because I really want the best life. I want to be in sync with your spirit and your will. I want to be a servant for you. I, I want to go where you want me to go. Give me some feedback it's a kind of observation and introspection. And that's what the examine is. Psalm 139 is David saying, Oh Lord, you have examined my heart. There's that word. And you know everything about me. You want to be alive to God? Do you want to be alive to God? If you do, then you've got to be wide open to God like that. If you close yourself off to God, you are not alive to God. So there's a scary, maybe vulnerable part here where we're all invited to think about this. Like, how ready are you to be open to God. How safe do you think that is? This gets down to what kind of God do you think he is? But David invites God to do what coach, tennis, tennis coach Hal did for me. Have a look at me. I, I, I don't want to keep doing what I'm doing and doing things my way. Later on, that same David said, search me. Look at all the words that he invites God to do. Search me, O God. And know my heart. Test me. Know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything that offends you and lead me along a path of everlasting life. I want my life to go your way, not mine. Examine me, tell me what you see, and lead me in the right way. So this is really, really remarkable, uh, I think. think. Go back to the very beginning of the Bible. Adam and Eve sinned, right? This horrible problem. You know, they, they sin, and um, what's the first thing they do when they figure out, uh-oh, we've really done a stupid thing here? What do they do? They hide. They run from God. They put fig leaves on. They cover up. They're running from God. God's like, hello, I can, you know I can see you. I'm right here. And he's like, oh, well, I, was, I did something stupid and I was afraid. So I hid and I ran. So you got David saying, here I am. God, I just search me, know me, test me. What, what do you have to say to me? I, I, I want you to see everything about my day and who I am and who I'm coming. And you got Adam running and hiding like, oh, yeah, I'm, but you can't see me, God. And we're every day either Adam or David. Every day we're Adam or David. When we hide stuff, which list are we more like? Well, we're afraid we're going to get caught. 
We're feeling lonely because we're not connected to God and we're not connected to other people. We're irritable because of so many things. So we're on the wrong list when we hide. So this isn't an invitation to do something that's painful. It might, it might be a little awkward at first, but when you understand the trusting eyes of God and the, the loving compassion of his heart, man, I tell you what, it's a beautiful thing to live openly and be an open book before God. And the examine is an invitation for you to do that in a way that most of us really don't. First Chronicles 28 says, The Lord sees every heart. He already knows. He, he knows every plan and thought. If you seek him, you'll find him. And he goes even deeper than that. Romans 8 says, you know those times when you don't even know what to pray, but you've got something down inside? Like the, the examine can go that deep. You've got something, you just don't know how you'd even say it to God. You're feeling so, such pain or such shame or such joy. You have no idea how you'd ever say it to God, but it's there. And Romans 8 says, oh, that's okay. The Spirit of God will help you in those kinds of weaknesses. We don't even know what we ought to pray for. And we all go, yeah, that's me. But the Spirit himself intercedes with groanings that cannot be expressed in words. But the Spirit will just step in and say, oh, what he's trying to say, Father, is this. And that happens through a process like the examine where you're just praying in a way that's real and raw and it's just you and God. It's the process of acting, asking God to help us see what God sees about us, to help me see it too. And to understand, get this, to understand that God has been present in every part of our lives. It's just that we go through so much of our lives and we don't think about God. And then later when we go back and we reflect, oh, God was there. We do that enough times. And then we learn to actually see God in the moment one day. So the examine, I want to also say, is, is a joint search. It's conducted by two parties. You're opening yourself to kind of say, let's have a look here. And there's two parties. The first is that we search our own hearts and minds. We, we, I often find that I just don't do that in my life. I'm not a very reflective person because I, I like to go on and get to the next thing. I'm always running to the next thing. The examine says, just kind of stop and pay attention a little bit. Like, where's your life going? Like, why are you acting that way? Why were you so short with him? What, what? Uh, what's happening, and, and the examination is done by myself. The second party, though, that's involved in this joint examination in the examine is, is the Lord, and the Lord's gaze is so different. If we're the lone examiners of our own heart, we too easily let ourselves off the hook. We justify ourselves. We're like, well, I'm innocent, or there's a reason, or we, or we do the opposite, and we're, we just come so hard on ourselves and we just condemn ourselves and fill ourselves with loathing and shame and how bad and dumb we are you know and, and so we're, we're either going to be too heavy on the praise or the blame if we're the only one when you invite God in we get a more truthful picture and a much more gentle and redemptive solution so think for a minute before I get to the how you do the examine think for a minute about um Levels of conversation. There are, you know, some say there's like five levels of conversation, right? So like you start in every conversation with cliche level talk, right? It's like, hey, how you doing? How's the weather? How about those ravens? Maybe next year. Okay, that's cliche. Then you go to fact sharing is a little bit deeper where it's like, hey, how you doing? You know, we're discussing something, but you know, hey, did you hear they lifted the mask mandate? You're just sharing a fact. Okay, great. You move on. Um, the third is where you're sharing of an opinion, which is a bit of a risk because someone might not agree with you, you know? They might reject you a little bit. You know, I'm actually glad they lifted the mask thing. You know, it's like throwing that out. It's my opinion, you know, throwing it out there. Now it's a little deeper, right? The next level is where you share actually an emotion. I'm really sad about this or I'm happy about that or I feel kind of insecure or this makes me upset. And then finally, the deepest level of conversation is where you're just completely honest. You're just like, you're not filtering it and carefully nuancing your words. You're just like, man, I really miss my dad since he died. But you know what, honestly, I've never said this out loud, but I, I don't think he was even a very good dad. Or I really want to be a better friends with you, but I don't know how to do that. I feel like, I mean, is there something I could be doing? Or my prayer life stinks. I don't ever pray. Everybody thinks I pray, but I don't ever pray. Those are pretty transparent, honest things. So when you think about your relationships with people, you can probably think of there's some people that, you know, you maybe just keep it shallow and maybe there's other, you know, but here's the truth, isn't it? How deep you go, if you only stay at level one, those friendships aren't going to be very deep, are they? You never have great friendships just talking about the ravens. If that's all you talk about. Well, let me ask you a more important question. As you think about your aliveness to God, how, 
how deep is your relationship with God? Like when you talk with God, what level do you hover at? Is it all cliches? Thank you for the food. Amen. Is it just the facts? I got this thing at work, God, help me with that. Or is it, you know, like, Lord, I think this is stupid, an opinion or an emotion, like I'm scared, or even laying it all out there. God, how do I, I'm broken. I, I, I'm, I don't get it. I, I need your help, whatever it might be. So those are important questions. And all of them set us up perfectly for where I want to take you now to the process of the exam, which is going to be much simpler than you think. And again, we're looking to be as truthful as possible, as open as possible, to give God not just our strengths, but our weaknesses, not just our, our beautiful giftedness, but our brokenness. Not just our, you know, happy times, but our lust and our narcissism and our greed and naming stuff where we were afraid and shrunk from courage and we lay it all at the altar of, of God. We don't have to suppress anything. We don't have to hide anything. And then trust, as we listen to our life that way, he will speak to us. All right. So the examine really brings insight into what God is saying in your life by asking ourselves two questions. The first question is simple. As you sit maybe and reflect on your day or something like that, you simply ask the question, what am I most grateful for? What am I most grateful for right now? Stop and think about it. Notice some stuff. Go back through your day. I like to do this in the evenings and I reflect on the previous day. You can do it in the morning and reflect on the previous day. You can do it anytime. But you, you, you simply think, what were the moments when I was feeling the most gratitude? You know, what, what, what is it? So I, I stop and I think about that. You maybe write a couple things down. You'll be surprised what happens if you don't rush. Give yourself some time. And then you, you move on after a couple minutes. You can do this whole thing in an hour. Or you can do the whole thing in five minutes. You move on to the second, you move on to the second question. Uh-oh. Did I lose my mic? Lost my mic, guys. Are we there? This is what I am least grateful for today. <laughs> Got a handheld for me, Vince? I don't know what happened. Oh, there we are. I'm back. Am I here? All right. Sorry, online people. You weren't, you were, they were sitting there watching me read lips. So sorry about that. So you got the first question, what am I most grateful for? This, the, the second question is, what am I least grateful for? Like where, where, what moment, what experience, what thing today made me feel not grateful at all? Like it made me feel bad. Those simple questions look like a little door, but they lead to a great room. And they help you identify your moments of consolation and desolation. And for centuries, people have prayed for direction from God and connection with God and insight from God and leading from God for great decisions, resolution to turmoil and joy from God by inviting God into everyday experiences like this that mark our lives so that we might learn to walk more closely and see his presence by simply asking these questions. Here's another way you could ask the questions. They all do the same thing. One of these might grab you, so this is where your notes might come in handy. For what moment today am I most grateful is one way to do this. And then you come later and ask, for what moment today am I least grateful? Think it through. You might make a list and then circle the one that's the most dominant. Third question, though, is ultra important. What do, what do I think Jesus might be saying to me about each of these? It might point you to Scripture. It might just, most of the time, God has planted so much truth in our hearts, we already know a lot of what he's trying to say to us if we just stop and listen. Or how about this way of saying it? When did I feel the most full of life today? Like I felt alive, I was energized, I was filled up, I felt good. Or, or when did I feel the most then drained of life? I felt like, gosh, I'm struggling, I was empty, I felt bad. And then how can I invite Jesus into each of these? See? Or this might be the way you prefer to answer the questions, like, what brought me great energy today? And then you might say, well, what drained me of energy today? Or even this way, what was today's high point? What was today's low point? 
That's okay. Just do it that way if you want to. And God will reveal himself to you. It's in the little things. Brother Lawrence was a, a person who wrote the practicing the presence of God. And what he said was, I sense and welcome God's presence in my life as much when I'm washing dishes and scrubbing floors as I do when I'm in the chapel singing hymns or listening to a sermon. It's in the everyday things, isn't it? The presence of God in everyday life, where you say, surely the presence of God was here, and I almost missed it. I didn't know it. So that examine teaches us to go back then and to see daily ordinary life with new eyes, where we begin to expect God to be speaking to us through everyday situations and conversations and things. And the more we reflect back on them the, the, night, the night of, the more the next day we're going to learn as we go through it to welcome and see God's hand and stuff. Does that make sense? Do it every day, I'm telling you. So let me give you some of the examine, uh, examples of why this can help us. This, this one's from a book called Sleeping with Bread. There was a pessimistic guy who happened to be very perfectionistic. And he has to deal with the fact that his personality affects everything the way he evaluates stuff. He says, when I hear one complaint, I put it above ten other good things. That's just the way I am. But I need the examine. And it helps me to notice not only what goes wrong, but what goes right. Before I, he did the exam and he never noticed those things. He fixated on what was wrong. When I do this exercise, I learn to give thanks for things that I would have bypassed. I notice and receive gifts that I otherwise would overlook. You just blew by them, never thought about them. The exam helps me name it, appreciate it, and see that God is with me in it. I'll tell you another thing for me. For, for, for me, I love to rush past bad feelings. I feel a lot of things deeply, but I also move on quickly because I've got more stuff to do, and so I can compartmentalize. And that works for, to a point when you just stuff things. But then it doesn't work so well. And the examine has been helpful for me to stop having so many parts of my life that are closed off to God. When you stuff stuff, it's closed off to God. You're closing it off to yourself, you think, so you don't have to feel that. I don't want to feel yucky right now, so I'll just, I won't. I'll just move on. But you're also closing off a part of what's real to God. And the examine is a gentle invitation to say, can I just be real with God? Maybe with no one else, but I can with God. If you rush past bad feelings, that might be a help for you. As it teaches us to say, wait, let's think about this. What stinks? What bothers you? How could God be in, in this? And then guess what? The bad feelings dissolve so much quicker. And I relook at stuff. I'm, maybe I'm not as angry with my wife as I, as I wanted to be because I've reframed it because God, as, he, as I invited God in, he just helped me rethink about the whole thing and my part differently. None of that happens if you don't slow down, invite God in, and reflect on what's going on. The power of gratitude is a big part of that. And that's one of the things it'll teach you. It just will help you rewire your heart in an important and powerful way. So what I would recommend is that you find a way to um, do the examine on a daily basis. We have given you a simple little guide as well. It's on the website. You can just use it. It's on you know, your podcast or YouTube. Pull it up on your phone. It'll walk you right through if you want a guide. I've got a little simple journal, and I, I think it's really helpful to write down uh, what, I'm, what I'm seeing and experiencing. It really helps me. I love going back. I just went back today. It's like, oh, yeah, that's right. I, had, I was sick January 4, but I had a fast recovery. I'm so grateful for the way God has wonderfully made my body. That's fun to go back and read. What would your journal say if you had some Consolation and desolation written in there. You know, one of the things is a lot of couples are discovering this is really wonderful to do together. One of those couples is friends of ours, chairman of our elders, Mike, Mike uh, and, and Jennifer Rittler. And I want you to hear their story about their use of uh, the examine. It's, uh, it's really helped me to walk closer with God. It's been life-giving in my relationship with the Lord. It came at a perfect time in our lives because we were both feeling pretty discouraged, pretty down, uh, and, and really in a bad place. You know, we just uh, found ourselves just frustrated with a lot of things and really letting a lot of small things really bother us. And, you know, and, and when you're not feeling right, like you're, you're, every part of your life is off. Your walk with God is off. Um, you, you know, the way you treat your family and your friends is off. Everything is a problem. And, uh, and it just so happened that I had a 
weekend retreat where we were going to cover similar topics. And uh, I came home and I said, let's start doing this. This will be good for us. Um, so we so we did. We typically use the examine uh, in the evenings. We've started actually keeping a journal, which has been helpful, and we'll answer the question: um, What were we what were we most grateful for during the day, or what were we least grateful for during the day? After we've written them down, we wind up sharing them with each other, and then and then talking about them and maybe why some of the whys as to why we wrote those things down. It's amazing how often we find that we have similar things that are what we were most grateful or least grateful for in a day. We learned a lot about ourselves. We learned the things that really make us tick, the things that God created us to do, the things that, that we feel most built up and encouraged by doing for Him. We also learned about the things that really drain life from us. And, uh, and that's been really healthy for us. We've been able to go back and, and see patterns in what things are most life-giving to us and what things are most life-draining. And, and that has really helped in, um, in making some better decisions, make changes in our life. The Examine really is a great tool that helps us stay in the flow of where God wants us. Uh, so just get started and you know, find someone to share it with, write it down if you have a moment. But remember, there's no rules. Use it however it works best for you uh, to build your relationship with God. My hope was that this would feel like a gift to you and not an assignment. My concern would be that you would just feel like, oh, it's one more thing to do, and you would just let it blow by. My encouragement to you is that there's nothing better than when your life is clicking and working right, and that only happens best when you're really staying alive to God. And this is a tool that could really help you. It'll make you more grateful, more attuned, more reflective, more wise. It'll help you make better decisions. It'll keep you on the right path. You can maybe do it with your kids. You can maybe do it with a friend or a spouse. You can do it all by yourself, as I do. You can share it out loud with some others, but we're inviting God in. And when you invite God in, you can grow. Let's pray. Lord, we, we thank you for being the kind of God that doesn't barge in like a traffic cop looking to write tickets, but you are our maker, creator, our friend, the one who loves us more than we love ourselves, the one who may want to purge some things that would be painful for us, but only and always for our benefit and blessing. So we pray that you'll help us to welcome you into every moment so that we can learn to see you in the moments as they come. Be reflective of your spirit in our lives to the glory and praise of our Lord Jesus Christ in whose name we pray and all God's people said.